Hello and welcome to Instant Transmission, a podcast where we discuss everything Dragon Ball and comedic timing. Boo's power has really put our fighters in a crummy situation. The fusion of Goten and Trunks into Go Tanks was sweet and everything was going just gravy, but it was all gummed up when their fusion came to an end. Gohan has just rolled onto the scene, so do not go anywhere because somebody is about to get creamed in this nutty situation. I can't finish it. <laughs> <laughs> you finished uh, something. I'm your host, Dayton, and once again, I'm joined by my co-host, Todd. Hi. And tonight we'll be covering... God, this is terrible. Tonight we'll be covering Kai's final chapter, episodes 150 through 158, as we... Hop into our part two coverage of the fusion saga. After defeating most of Earth's greatest warriors and wiping all but a small handful of life out on Earth, Boo is down to his last couple of challengers. The powerful fusion of Goten and Trunks into Go Tanks nearly defeated the pink monster, but its limit, its time limit had elapsed. And I'm so off this intro, but I'm going to keep rolling with it. Its time limit elapsed before the battle could be decided. Gohan arrives on scene just in time to save the boys, and after training with the Kais, his new power level spooks off Boo into hiding. But Boo decides to smugly return, showing his face for some mysterious, unrevealed reason. And with all that covered, was there anything you wanted to add before we got things started, Todd? We're doing it live, baby! <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, that leads us into episode 150, Boo's Sinister Scheme. Gotenks is absorbed, and yep, there's... There's his mysterious reason already revealed right off the bat. And this episode starts off with where the last one left off. Boo standing before our warriors and him demanding that the young Saiyans fuse once more so he can finish their battle. And there's this kind of smugness from Boo that he really shouldn't have. Considering the last we saw, Gotenks was kind of wiping the floor with them. And now we have Gohan on scene. And so Boo seems like he should be really outgunned at this point. And I mean, the aside from Goten and Trunks, both Piccolo and Gohan and even, you know, the other people watching are like, this is weird. Like, what a weird request. And it it is weird. Like, they should feel like this is like a strange request. Uh, like, there's something there's something up here, obviously. But the kids bite hard they're like oh we're not gonna let you talk about us like that and they're like all right get out of the way gohan we're fusing yeah and you know the boys are all arrogant they're ready for the fight and while all this discussion between gohan and the boys on whether or not you know they're gonna let them fight boo we see these like two pieces of of goo just kind of fall off of boo's back and start kind of covertly sliding and slinking off into their own directions and so we see that Boo kind of has his own, I guess, plan or strategy going on in the background. He's actually scheming right now. Yeah, this is interesting because Boo, this form of Boo, we still kind of get the impression or they've tried to show us and tell us that Boo's not the brightest creature. Uh, but he's got a, a decent little plan, even though he's very... I guess he's very straightforward about it. He's like, hey, I'm here to fight the, the kids. I want them to defuse. <laughs> and I mean, this is one of the first situations where we've seen Boo actually be completely outgunned, right? It's every fight he's been in, he's kind of been the superior power. And if he wasn't, it wasn't for very long. So it's seeing a side of Boo that I guess he didn't really need to reveal up until this point. That's a good point. Uh, but... This does result in the boys taking the bait. They fuse and immediately go into Super Saiyan 3. They're, they kind of voice that they're trying to rectify the fact that they didn't immediately go into Super Saiyan 3 last time. And as soon as they jump forward to fight Majin Buu, this pink ball of M Boo's body leaps out to kind of wrap them up, and the second piece leaps out to wrap up Piccolo. Yeah, and it's... I thought it was interesting because my first thought when you see the two little pink slime balls slide off is that you're thinking, oh, it's Goten and Trunks, or it's like a backup plan, or even Gohan, right? you kind of don't really expect Piccolo to be dragged into the situation. So that was honestly the one that caught me off guard at first. 
And I mean, we'll find out in a little bit as to why he does that, but it's it's definitely a very high level scheme from somebody who's really been shown to be almost like a child up until this point. Yeah, definitely. I, of course, having watched Dragon Ball Z, I remembered that he absorbed both Gotenks and Piccolo, but I forgot that he did it at the same time. So I, I similarly was like, why does he have those two pieces of himself out there? Uh, but this results in Boo, those two pieces that kind of wrap themselves around Gotenks and Piccolo shoot back over to the main body of Boo and he fully absorbs and assimilates them into his own mass and his own power specifically. And he kind of transforms subtly where he gets a nose of all things uh, and his his clothes change. He He puts on the... The iconic fusion dance vest and his I think one of the other big details is that his antenna is now like three times as long or something for some reason <laughs> I'm okay so my theory on that is because go tanks was in Super Saiyan 3 and his hair was extraordinarily long I think it's supposed to reflect that but that's just a theory that's a cool idea see I I didn't put those together but yeah I would buy that for sure um but like you said, Dayton, this also reveals Boo's plan where he absorbed Piccolo because Piccolo is the brains of all of this operation. Yeah, and you notice it right away when Boo has kind of been just grunting at things and yelling and using usually not more than a few words in a sentence. Now he gives this big, long explanation in great detail on how he had planned all of this. And this was his really his only way for him to actually defeat Gohan and Gohan's a little puzzled and actually pressures him. Like, why didn't you absorb me if you wanted to be stronger? And <clears throat> Boo responds with what's the point of being the strongest if there's no one to fight. And I just have a note here. This is sell anybody. I deeply hate this. I hate this so much. <laughs> you know, I... when you mentioned that, that this part of his personality bothered you, I, before, I, I don't remember him saying all this stuff until you pointed it out. And now I'm kind of looking for it. I'm like, okay, yeah, this is actually, this is a bigger part of his character than I had remembered. I, even though, like, I knew that the fan base had kind of made comparisons to Boo, saying that he was like a worse sell. I didn't remember it being such a big part of his personality either. And the any of these these moments of dialogue where Boo is like, Gohan, I left you so that I could fight you and prove that I'm the strongest, most powerful creature in the universe. I'm like, ah, I fucking hate this side of Boo so much. <laughs> and it kind of like, it, I don't know, it kind of comes out of nowhere, too. I don't know why he thinks this way, why he needs to be the most powerful. That's, there's nothing ever really established to say that that's an important part of his character. No, I mean... <sighs> Boo was effectively created through magic by Bibbidi. I mean, very similar to Cell being created through science, effectively. Uh, but it is early on established that Cell was created to, to kill Goku and to be the perfect being. That is not established at all with Majin Boo. <laughs> Yeah, and it probably wouldn't bother me or maybe others as much as if we didn't come off the heels of Cell into right. Boo, and now we've got two villains kind of back to back with the same motivation, and so it it kind of makes it stand out even more because the last thing you watched was basically the thing you're comparing it to. I mean, not only the same motivation, but let's compare the fact now too that Boo has just shown that he can absorb people i i mean that screams <laughs> sell <laughs> hey, where, where have we seen that before huh yeah, yeah that's not great also uh can regenerate from basically nothing huh does that sound familiar all of these like like boo can kind of do some of these things better honestly can just do them better than sal can which in my opinion is again a mark against boo because Sal had some limitations in terms of how he could absorb people and uh, even his regeneration, even though he came back from a single cell, 
it still felt more limited than Boo's regeneration feels. Yeah, we we've seen Boo come back from like being smoke and stuff like that, and I don't know. It's there's the it's kind of a limitless regeneration. Whereas maybe with Cell, there were some downsides to it. But then, then again, at the same time, Cell exploded and then got his perfect form and learned instant transmission from it. So it's mileage may vary. Yeah, but at least that was only one time. We've seen Boo do that probably dozens of times at this point. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, maybe maybe we'll uh we'll dive deeper into that comparison later on down the line, but Yeah, definitely. We we now have this intelligent uh cell knockoff uh form of Boo that's walking around. And yeah, whatever whatever the name of this form of Boo is, it and Gohan begin to face off and they kick off with exchanging just heavy blow after heavy blow. The one thing I want to point out though with this fight is that I didn't think the animation, the choreography was very good here. And uh, I don't know. This was not a very exciting fight to watch. I agree. One detail that I did like, I don't think that you'll like this as much, but I wanted to point it out is there's the moment where Gohan squares off to fight against Boo where Gohan takes the same stance as Goku took against fighting Vegeta in the Saiyan arc. He's like down with one fist back, one fist forward. And it's, of course, while he's got Goku's gi on. So I really like that they hit home those like homages to Goku. Uh, I have a feeling you might feel differently, Dayton, but I don't know. I just thought it was fun that they put that in there. Uh, I mean, it's, it's fine. I I really don't feel the same connection between Gohan and Goku as maybe other people do. So for me, it's like, well, it's it feels a little forced. I also don't know why they're doing it now because he just spent all this time training with the Kais. So I know. now we're going to reference Goku. This feels really weird. I, the reason that I like it <laughs> is if they would have stuck to their original plan of Gohan taking over the role that Goku took as like the main character, like seeing parallel after parallel after parallel for Gohan being re referenced to like the role that Goku had. I like if Gohan became the main character, <laughs> you know, and I think you're right about that because maybe I would feel a lot differently about this if things play out differently in the future. But I think I'm always, I, I can't unknow what i know so i know and on top of that it's it's this isn't a great fight it's not great animation no. um it's not great choreography and it all just culminates in the uh which don't get me wrong i like this dragon ball uh trope of all right let's stop holding back now <laughs> yeah and i mean it's it it feels fairly even in terms of power right like even though boo absorbed gotenks and piccolo at least until they say, let's stop holding back. It feels even. And then Boo starts wiping the floor with Gohan very, very quickly. He starts using things like the uh, special beam cannon. Um, starts using, you know, his stolen techniques. Sell anybody. <laughs> uh, and yeah, he he quickly brings Gohan to his knees. Yeah. And I mean, it's it's all done. It kind of ends with um Gohan's kind of beaten and left in a weakened state after the the special beam cannon and it's at this point Boo decides to let loose this ghost kamikaze attack which Gohan bites on he takes the bait and he moves in and he karate chops one of these ghosts and there's this spectacular explosion and this is more or less where this episode comes to an end is Gohan being beaten by a child's attack yeah, I think that pretty much takes it in the next episode, but I do just want to say I still love the Ghost Kamikaze attack. I do, I do as well. Full marks on that one. That is a fun-ass attack. I also yeah. forgot that they did some cool stuff with it later, so I can't wait to talk about that. Absolutely. So, Boo, at this point, going into episode 151, the Elder Kai's brainstorm, Return to Life, Goku. Um, Boo is just toying with Gohan at this point. He's even, like, pulling his blow, stopping them before they contact Gohan and lecturing him the whole time. So Boo is just more or less toying with his food at this point. I just, uh, well, <laughs> it's going to kind of come to a close here shortly, but I forgot how short 
Gohan's spotlight is in, in this part of the arc. Like, he comes in, he fights Boo for maybe, like, half an episode before Boo is, like, dips out, and then Boo comes back, absorbs Gotenks and Piccolo, and now Gohan's already getting his ass beat. <laughs> yeah, I... After watching all this stuff that happens with Gohan, I... I don't I got a note in here somewhere where I just said they really did go on dirty. Like I was really unhappy with the way all this stuff finishes out. We're about at the point where Gohan's not really involved anymore. All that really happens is um, we get a neat scene where um, Gohan's being held by the neck, held up by the neck by Boo. Um, and he's just having the life squeezed out of him. And before Boo can strike the final blow, we get an unlikely hero that runs onto the scene and it's B and the puppers is barking at the monster and when Boo looks over, Mr. Satan jumps out of the shadows and delivers one of his iconic kicks, which of course does nothing, but it's kind of cool seeing them actually kind of brave up and get involved. It's such a... This is like a 20-second scene. I fucking love this, though. <laughs> like, for... I mean, I the dog involvement is fun. What I like is Mr. Satan actually getting in there and trying to attack the guy... Like he's, I mean, he's still, he doesn't, he still doesn't understand the level to which he's outclassed, but he, he has some idea that he's not going to be able to do anything to boo. Uh, and yet he still goes out there and tries to help Gohan. So props to him. I mean, I, I love it. It, it could also be one of the situations where ignorance is bliss, where he's just like, you know what? It's, it doesn't matter how much stronger than me he is. He's just stronger than me at some point. So I don't care. I'm going to, I have to do something. Yeah, absolutely. We'll see how ignorant he is coming up here, but uh, <laughs> he does give Gohan a chance to kind of get out of the, the stranglehold, but that just turns into Boo then using another one of Gotenks' attacks with the, gosh, I forget what the, the attack is called, but it's basically the energy rings that cinch Gohan around the body and the legs. Yeah, and Gohan is once again overwhelmed and in a bad situation. And watching from the world of the Kais, it's obvious to them how bad this situation currently is. And this is where the Elder Kai offers kind of a workaround to try and salvage this universal ending situation. And the plan is, he can give up his own life, and he can gift it to Goku, allowing him to return to the world of the living. And this is interesting to me. I don't know how I feel about this workaround. How, what are your feelings on this? I, I wanted to hear yours too. For me, I don't think I like it because Dragon Ball already notoriously has a problem with consequences because the Dragon Balls themselves and multiple sets of Dragon Balls exist anytime somebody dies or something bad happens they just wish that that thing never happened and there's no consequences so it feels like we kind of go through these events for you know without any impact and just adding one more way for people to come back to life after death i don't like it yeah especially i mean just to go just a little bit further um what ends up happening is, is the Elder Kai kind of closes his eyes for a second, thinks about it, falls over like he's dead, Goku's halo disappears, and then the Elder Kai just leans back up and has a halo. Like, it's not even really... It, it doesn't mean anything, right? It's just like, oh, you're alive now. I agree with you. I will say, though, I actually love that gag. <laughs> it was funny. I did laugh at it. But at the same time, it's just like, I don't know. It just makes you understand how cheap life is in the Dragon Ball universe at this point. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I agree with that part of it. I, I did like, though, because they even go so far as to, like, set the scene with, like, this very somber, sad music as the the uh, Grand Supreme Kai is, like, uh, giving up his life. And then he falls over. Uh, and then, yeah, he just pops back up like... Goku, what are you waiting for? Go get him! <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, yes, it is funny, but it's also a joke at their own expense, I, which, right. you know, whatever. I'll take the laugh. It, it is funny. Um, but yeah, so Goku's back to life. Yay! Um, speaking of uh, 
uh, people coming back to life, we pop over to a scene of Vegeta standing before King Yema. And it's revealed that King Yema actually preserved his soul, thinking that this might be their ace in the hole, just in case the universal threat of Boo becomes a problem. And it's interesting because does is he I don't know what his role in all this is and what he's allowed to do and what what are the rules like? I, I don't know. I don't know what the rules are, man. I have so many questions. We're constantly breaking them, which is probably one of the problems. Well, one of several problems that people have with the Boo arc in particular. I also have a bone to pick with this scene because I don't like the fact that we as the audience get this scene before Vegeta's arrival. I think it would make it much more tense if we did not know that Vegeta was on his way. <laughs> yeah, that's true, too. Um, yeah, sometimes they oversell us some or overgive us information where sometimes I would have been nice to just kind of watch it happen as it's happening versus being explained everything before before anything happens because right now we we know the situation we know what's going to happen i think this honestly this could have been like a 30 second flashback after vegeta shows up on the scene this uh, in the order that this is given to us really kind of wrecks the tension for me i love the idea of you show vegeta standing before king yama and yama says something along the lines of oh i've been waiting for you i have something special planned for you and just leave it kind of ominous at that point. Keeping it more subtle. I see that's like a that's a good in between, I think. Uh, I would definitely be on board for that. And Vegeta definitely has a past where something special might be planned. And we had the scene with um uh Deborah earlier where he did something special with Deborah, gave him his own special torture. So it would have been like we already have a precedent for him doing things with named important characters, so it would have played right in. That see, I like that a lot. That's a really good idea. If they would have, they would have had to word it like make it feel like the same situation as if Vegeta was going to get the same treatment that Deborah did, and then you know they're they're twisting it, they're uh, subverting our expectations. That's the word where you know we're like, oh shit, this sucks for Vegeta, and then we're like, oh shit, Vegeta's on the scene. I think it would have been a lot of fun. I think, and I would have liked that a lot. Because when Vegeta obviously comes back later, because we know that he just talked about doing that, um, it's there's at least that thought in my head of, oh, man, I probably could have maybe figured that out or maybe thought about that. Like, I don't like being completely surprised. Give me a, just the smallest little bit of breadcrumbs and let me try and put it together. I don't mind it if if you don't give me much and I can't figure it out. But I like it when you kind of, you know, foreshadow a little bit. I'm on board with that for sure. I I don't like being spoon fed. I'd rather be surprised than spoon fed. But I also I, I think it is. I think your point is good. I think it's better to give those breadcrumbs for the audience to figure it out if they're being very keen on the details. But uh, we go from there to M- Mr. Satan pulling out a very realistic pistol and threatening to shoot Boo. I thought that was kind of cool. Talk about ignorance, right? Where he's basically <laughs> like, well, I guess I got to really bring in the hand cannon didn't want to do this but take that boo <laughs> i thought this is hilarious also it is a very realistic looking pistol like this is not a cartoon gun this is a man with an actual firearm like the guy has watched boo get shot with multiple guns and rocket launchers <laughs> yeah but this this time it's gonna work like you, you just wait and see it doesn't but uh yeah we get to see goku preparing to leave uh, the world of the Kais, but he's halted by Elder Kai and is asked, what is your plan once you get there? And Goku more or less doesn't really have one. Um, he mentions maybe like fusing or something like that, but Elder Kai wise, wisely brings up, yeah, he's going to give you time to teach your son the fusion dance. That way you guys can fuse and beat him. And this is where he's gifted the Patara earrings and told that they form uh, a they have a similar effect, uh, similar to that of the fusion dance, um, but much more powerful. And he advises Kabito and Supreme Kai to go ahead and put one earring on each of the their opposite ears. 
and see the effect. And we see the two, I guess, immortal beings um, pull towards each other, smash together, and boom, we've got a brand new Supreme Kai. And it's at this point that Elder Kai tells them that the fusion is permanent. <laughs> I don't know that was I like just... a massively dick move. I mean, I, I like the comedy in it. I have so much to say about this, but okay. First off, we've talked about in the past, how Akira Toriyama loves to introduce characters in pairs. So like Kabito and the Supreme Kai were introduced as a pair, but now we've got this grand Supreme Kai. So they basically found a way to be like, ah, we don't need three of these guys. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. So that is a clever way of getting rid of one. So that way you can have a pair, I guess. It's it's just funny. I, I thought that part is funny to me. Also, they explicitly said, like you mentioned, Dayton, that this fusion, the Patara Earring fusion, is more powerful than the fusion dance. So all of you fucking people out there who are like... Who's stronger, Gogeta or Vegito? It's Vegito. Vegito is stronger than <laughs> Gogeta. <laughs> yeah, so it's it's the a type of fusion that really amps up their power. It's multiplicative. It's it's an insane level of fusion, but it comes with that downside of you can never separate once you're formed together. And we'll quickly find out later that that's not true. But for now, that is a an interesting prospect. That retcon, well, we'll see. The the later retcon in Super infuriates me, but we'll talk about that when we get to it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, uh, yeah, we've uh, got some Patara earrings from uh, the Kais that Goku's going to use for some fusion. And, uh, yeah, we flip back over to Gohan, who continues to struggle against Boo, and he's thrown into the dirt, and he's beaten and battered around. Um, Dende rushes up and heals Gohan back up to full health. And it's at this point that Boo decides that he's going to just take care of the party healer and just kind of get rid of that. But when he attempts to, we get this errant key blast from off screen that kind of flies in and saves Dende. And this is when Tien is revealed. And you want to talk about a character done dirty. <laughs> oh my God, I didn't realize how badly he was done dirty. Because let, let, let's go through all of Tien's real actions in the Boo saga. He's arrived unseen and he saved Dende from being killed. Um, he fires off a tri-beam attack uh, and it does nothing and he realizes he's worthless. Man. <laughs> like, I don't even know why this is here. I I really don't. Like, it, it feels like a needless callback. Like, there's a part of me in the moment that was like, oh, Tien, cool. And then Tien gets fucking bitch slapped. Um, it just, it feels like a, a much worse version of when Tien used his tri-beam on Imperfect Cell. And this is, this one is just unnecessary and he doesn't really accomplish anything. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, I mean, he, he wasn't going to kill Cell, but it felt like he was at least doing something. He was buying time in a situation where they needed it, right? And so it was kind of a heroic sacrifice and it, it was kind of badass, actually. I actually like that scene. Absolutely. That scene against Cell is great. This scene against Bood is like, why? The only there will be a reason that I like him being on the scene though coming up. So maybe it's this is the reason that they even put him in here at all. Oh, don't worry. He's got one more role to play as far as I know. And we'll find out in a second because Boo raises his arms and we see him preparing just to destroy the entire earth. And as everyone just kind of stands there and gawks, this is where Goku just Pops into reality and uh, slices Boo in half with a Destructo disc. Um, oddly enough, this animation was really well done. I don't know if you noticed that. It's really good. I actually wanted to pause on it just briefly to ask you because, I mean, Destructo disc is your main man Krillin's technique. And I think, I'm pretty sure, this is Goku's first time using it. I could be wrong about that. But what did you think about Goku using it? Uh, I mean, it's it's... Goku learned the Kamehameha when he was like a baby um, by seeing it once. He's seen Krillin use it how many times? Of course, Goku would know how to use Destructo Discs. <laughs> um, I assume he just doesn't around Krillin because he doesn't want to flex, but 
<laughs> yeah, it's like, yeah, I'm fine with him using it. Um, He knows his best friend's technique. I'm totally cool with this. The animation was also awesome for it. Uh, the only downside is that I feel like Destructo Discs, like ever since Frieza, every Destructo Disc after that is just kind of a throwaway Destructo Disc, though. It, yeah, like I... I think I agree with you wholesale. Like, I, it makes sense that Goku knows how to use it. I like your headcanon that Goku doesn't use it around Krillin, so it's not to flex on him. But the fact that so many people can use this technique just makes it feel cheaper, right? Like, it makes it feel less special that Krillin was, like, the first person that we saw really use that technique. You know, I've I thought about that, and I've I'm on both sides of that argument where... There's one side of me that says, yeah, that's his iconic technique. They should really only let him do it. Otherwise, you're right. It does cheapen it. On the other side, though, it's not a very complex technique. So yeah. it's just like you're chopping things with an energy disc. Um, and I mean, th we're talking about this in the same saga where people are summoning like ghosts out of their mouth and crap like that. So just a, a blade of energy is not really anything that's to write home about, but to go back to the other side, how many people have just like a key blast signature technique that's more or less generic, except for maybe a, a color change, right? I mean, probably dozens. Like, yeah. <laughs> that, but that's... I, I agree with you again. It's just... I think that's why, because so many people just use like beam techniques and they're like, Final Flash, Kamehameha, blah, blah, blah. blah. They're basically interchangeable. Uh, but that's why I kind of like having the, like, unique techniques that, you know, only Krillin knows or only Piccolo knows or whatever. But, yeah, it should be easy for most people if they can control key to make a blade out of it. So, I agree. If anything, um, what, what I actually want is I want Krillin to just take that technique to the next level and do something interesting with it, right? We've seen Goku use the Kamehameha wave to, like, propel himself at things. He's ridden on them. He's... I mean, he's summoned them into balls and, like, controlled them from afar. Goku's done just a, a tremendous amount of crazy things with the Kamehameha Wave. I just want to see Krillin do that with the Destructo Disc. That That's more of what I care about. I don't care if everyone's throwing around energy discs. I just want my boy to be the best at it. That's a good point. That would be really cool to see Krillin innovate on the Destructo Disc. I mean, we already saw Frieza use multiples and control them and stuff. Like, Krillin could do something like that or something brand new. But I didn't mean to focus on it too much. I just thought it was fun that Goku used that and interesting. Oh, I'm always down for a Krillin conversation, even if it's like Krillin adjacent things that are happening. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, I mean, we... Goku, oh yeah, Goku pops into reality, yeah. uh, cuts Boo in half with the Destructo Disc, the animation was really smooth, and then we pop into episode 152, which is Miracles Happen Once, will Goku and he make the ultimate combination? I want to, sorry, I'm like, I'm waving at Dayton in the camera, but I want to point out that I actually, I, I do not normally like the titles that they use for these episodes because they usually are huge spoilers. I love the way that this one is worded because it's will Goku and he make the ultimate combination. Who the fuck is he? We don't know. Could be anybody. Could be Gohan. That's the plan, right? But well, hold on. are you saying that the first episode we cover, which is Boo Sinister Scheme, Go Tanks Absorbed, spoiled something? <laughs> no, man. I don't even know what's going to happen with that title. <laughs> no, I agree with you. It actually this episode name stood out to me because it didn't spoil what was going to happen. 100%. That's why I wanted to pause on it and point that out because I was like, "Oh, this is a great title. Most of the other episodes are terrible at spoiling things." <laughs> well, this episode kicks off with Goku and Boo exchanging some pleasantries, and uh this is where Tien gets his other important scene in the Boo saga. Uh Boo's legs stand up on their own. And then knock Tien the fuck out in one kick before reuniting with the rest of Boo. I mean, why is Tien here? I, in a second, there will be a reason why I like him being on scene, but it's just 
he does almost nothing. <laughs> I, I even put little quotes here, LOL, because I thought it was so funny. I think I actually laughed out loud when I saw this happen. <laughs> I was like, man, that was just kind of a dick move. Why'd you have to knock Tien out? Tien just gets shafted, man. I'm pretty sure in the, the Tournament of Power, he gets shafted to, like, after... Gosh, is it after the Saiyan arc? I think after the Saiyan, like, the Saiyan arc is the last time that he's been relevant. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's fine to just let him retire, man. He runs, like, a, a martial arts school and just has his mountain home and, you know, he's, he's just a chill guy. It's okay for him to just go do TN things. You don't have to keep bringing him back as a punching bag. Yeah, yeah, no, I agree. Uh, this kind of r turns into, though, I mean, Cell, or Cell. Look at that. I called him Cell. They're the same <laughs> character. They're the same uh, picture basically the same boo putting himself back together and goku has one of these patara earrings on and tosses the other one to gohan to which gohan misses the catch I, what do you think about this dayton like i'm i'm so torn on the fact that these two like trained martial artists who are very i, I mean just very good with their bodies muscles fighting coordination all this stuff either one of them threw poorly or one of them caught poorly i don't what do you think about this uh i mean it it is in line with dragon ball humor i've seen so like it doesn't take me out of the universe sort of thing right but it's also kind of like artificial drama i guess i don't know like it's kind of injected here not necessarily and of course, like it falls through the cracks and then Gohan finds it. And then there's an explosion uh, caused by Boo kind of on purpose. So that way Gohan has to find it again. Like it's, I don't know. It's kind of this goofy Looney Tunes situation, but also everyone on earth was killed by this guy. So I, I don't know how to feel. I'm still stuck on that. I'm sorry. I, yeah, I think overall, I don't like it. Like I, I kind of agree with you that it, it feels a little bit like Dragon Ball humor, but I don't feel like it's a good use of that type of humor like you kind of pointed out that it feels like unnecessary drama and it i mean like i said these guys are <laughs> these guys can zip around at the speed of light and like you know they're throwing perfect punches and kicks and stuff for them to just not be able to throw and catch an object feels it takes me out of it a little bit yeah and i mean i don't mind necessarily something like that happening but there was no context as to why, like why did Gohan miss or something like that? Like why did Goku throw poorly? Just a why anywhere in there would have been great. I mean, they could have even had Boo like punch Goku in the face while Goku's throwing the earring. And that would have been, that would have made that scene 100% better for me. <laughs> Actually. Yeah. That would have been great. Just, I just need a little bit more something other than like, two of the world's greatest martial artists can't toss something to each other. Yeah, exactly. 100%. It's a, uh, maybe I'm getting minor nitpicky here, but there's, I don't know, man. Like, again, I like the Boo arc, but there's a lot of these episodes that I'm like, that's just, mm, that like stuck in my craw. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, why are we spending so much time on this? And I mean, yeah. this whole time, now Goku has to jump up to Super Saiyan 3 just to defend himself. And Goku's sort of being pushed back, and this culminates in uh, the Gotenks fusion actually running out. And this once indomitable Boo is now reverting to this. Rather than having the fusion vest, he now just has the iconic shoulder pads of Piccolo, and it's kind of goofy looking. Yeah, I mean, Goku even points out, like, your powers dropped significantly. Uh... I, I don't think Piccolo would really give, in terms of power, would give Boo much of a bump. So, I mean, Super Saiyan 3, Goku might even be able to beat Boo in this form. Uh, Gohan almost certainly can. <laughs> yeah, and just kind of... Uh, fusion's complicated and all over the place, but kind of what's implied is that uh, the way Boo does fusion isn't as powerful as the other forms of fusion we've been told about. And so even though he's like Boo started off powerful and Goten and Trunks are still Super Saiyan level warriors, right? They're still powerful for their age. So you figure two Super Saiyan warriors worth of power ups plus him being Boo and I don't know, 
plus Piccolo. Plus, he looks like Piccolo for some reason. I don't know how they decided that. I think it was just for the the, the gags. It, yeah, probably partly the gags. I mean, I would I would probably argue that Piccolo is stronger than Goten and Trunks. So maybe it's like the primary or like the strongest thing that he's absorbed. I don't know. That's just a random guess. Honestly. Yeah, I'm just guessing too. But yeah, um, now Boo has to do his backup plan, which is uh. Gohan and absorbing him and he does he just kind of does it like there's no real like build up or anything it just kind of happens yeah um I think the the only thing here he absorbs so many people I'm trying to remember how he did this one this one he I think he deliberately left a piece of his antenna on the ground and that was like his backup plan so good on him he was kind of planning ahead like thinking about this i think it was the piece that got cut off when goku cut him in half and he just kind of left it there as a, a trap for whomever yeah and this little piece that was sitting on the ground catches gohan off guard and gohan is absorbed and suddenly we get this boo who has uh the orange and blue fighting gi top which is how we know that gohan was absorbed and this is where I have my note of Gohan was done so freaking dirty this arc, man. Like, this is the end of Gohan's journey, really? Yeah. Uh, this is what I was kind of getting at earlier. Like, for all the buildup that we had for Gohan basically being the next main character and, you know, he's going to take the spotlight and be the hero instead of his father, that lasted maybe a couple of episodes. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, we never really get to see Gohan have a good fight, in my opinion. Like, there's no. nothing that stands out to me in this entire arc where I'm like, yeah, Gohan did blank, which was awesome. I mean, the the coolest thing Gohan does is come on the scene and deliver the line, fight you? No, I'm here to kill you. Like, and then <laughs> punch Boo in the gut. Like, that is the coolest thing he does this entire arc. <laughs> yeah, which I love the bravado, especially from somebody who usually doesn't have that kind of bravado. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, just getting to see that confidence in him is is super cool. And I mean, the let's be real, Gohan, it, Boo absorbing people aside, Gohan is and will continue to be through the end of this arc the strongest single person period the single creature uh outside of any sort of fusions or absorptions like he's stronger than super saiyan 3 goku he's stronger than vegeta who only gets the super saiyan 2 stronger than piccolo goten trunks uh which is insane and it's wild to think about that like dragon ball z ends with gohan being vastly the strongest person and still getting his ass kicked so that that's really cool <laughs> Yeah, it doesn't amount to anything, right? This is this is my frustration with this arc. Like, we now have... This is kind of like the tipping point where Dayton and I have been super excited about the prospect that was set up. Like, you know, Goku stepped aside. He deliberately... He even says, I think, in one of these episodes that when he was in Super Saiyan 3 and fighting Fat Boo... He was probably strong enough to beat Fat Boo, but he didn't so that the boys would get their chance to do so. And now we're going backwards because we got to see Goten and Trunks' journey. They they failed. We got to see Gohan coming on the scene trying to take over the role of savior for, well, for both Goku, but also because Goten and Trunks failed. Gohan has failed. Now, Goku is resurrected. Goku's on the scene. And Goku's currently the only one who can even put up a fight against Boo. Yeah, and the thing Goku's running into now is that with Gohan absorbed, Goku is no match for Boo in his current state. And on top of that, he has nobody to fuse with. He, he's looking around and he's checking out his potential prospects. And it's Mr. Satan and uh, Dende and uh, Tien. None of them are really great candidates. This is the only reason I like Tien being here, because even though Goku kind of writes him off because he's knocked the fuck out, 
Tien is the honestly the best option, right? Tien's certainly a better option than Dende or Mr. Satan. Uh, at least Tien is a fighter, even though he's not strong by Boo's standards. It would it would certainly create a strong fighter to form or to fuse with Tien. Uh, and I I also totally forgot that we actually get on screen the the visual concepts of both. Goku fusing with Dende and Goku fusing with Mr. Satan, which I I know that that's a gag in the video games, like that character, uh, Goku, I think is it's, it's called. <laughs> I didn't realize it had a name. That's great. <laughs> yeah, they use, well, at least for the American versions, they use Hercule and Goku. Uh, they call it Goku. But I forgot that we actually got the visual for it, and I love that. <laughs> I mean, it's a lot of fun. And we get, I mean, we get all three of them too, so it's like Goku and Dende where it's kind of Goku y face, but he's all green and he's got the antenna and he thinks about how what would Chi Chi think if she saw this? Like it's pretty fun. I love that. Actually did they I might have even overlooked it. Did they show Tien and Goku? I don't remember because the other ones are much more funny to remember. They are, yeah, one hundred percent. Uh they do like a few of the games they show a lot of those fusions too, which is just fun. <laughs> but it's at this point that uh uh, Dragon Ball is really good at timing because timing is drama and this is where Goku senses a sudden new power arrive on the planet and this new power is Vegeta and Goku quickly teleports over before Boo can begin fighting him yeah uh, I mean the, the drama here is good I still think it would have been better adjusting it kind of like either the way that I said or the way that you said Dayton but I like this moment because now we're like, oh, okay, well, obviously now Goku and Vegeta have to fuse. But the moment that Goku explains this to Vegeta, Vegeta's like, oh, hell no. I am not going to be in a single body with you, Kakarot. Yeah, and Boo picks up on their location, starts rocketing towards them immediately. And Vegeta's, I mean, he would rather have Oblivion than fuse with Goku, and he's pretty pissed. And it's at this point that Goku is screaming at Vegeta and he's telling him, and it's all logical, Boo is far more dangerous now than he was earlier. And remember, he killed you earlier. Fusion is literally our only chance to win. And I mean, our prince fights for the honor of the Saiyan race, man. He's He is not going to fuse with Goku. Boo shows up and Vegeta goes on, in on the attack. I... 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 I mean, I'm a full-on Vegeta fanboy, so I love all of this, but I took down one line that I really particularly enjoyed when Goku's basically telling Vegeta, like, we can't win like this. We have to use fusion. And Vegeta responds with, if you think I'll back down from a fight just because I know I can't win, then you don't know me at all. And even now, like, saying that makes me emotional. It is such a good line from Vegeta. <laughs> I mean, it's, you know, it's not arrogance. It's rising up to the challenge, right? Well, it's some arrogance, but it's rising up to the challenge. It's <laughs> pushing and proving yourself and looking for, you know, a way to overcome that, that next mountain peak. And it's part of the reason why he's as strong as he is today, right? It's that push. It's that drive. 100%. And because of that, kind of pride and arrogance uh but also that you know drive to just meet that challenge vegeta just throws himself headlong at boo uh goku and vegeta are kind of struggling to fight boo because vegeta refuses to fuse and throughout this i mean the fighting here is is fine it's not anything to write home about necessarily but what they kind of find out or what Goku finds out, I suppose here is another part that I really enjoy because he realizes Vegeta is mad at Goku for not fighting him with super Saiyan three. And, uh, Vegeta says, you made me think that I was your equal, even though you had this other transformation that you could have used to beat me easily. And he, one of the other lines I really like from him is he says, you thought I didn't deserve your true power. You treated me like a child. And oh man, that just gets to the core of Vegeta's character. Like 
I love it so much. You know, it's it's really interesting to think about that because if Goku had used his full power against Vegeta earlier, I don't know how that plays out. It might turn into a situation where Goku might be forced to actually kill Vegeta. And if you're Goku, you don't want to do that, right? And also you're looking for a fair fight, so that wouldn't be very fun either. So I get all of Goku's reasons for not showing it to Vegeta. And it's really bizarre that that decision is coming back to haunt him in a weird way. Yeah, and I mean, even one reason in addition to that for Goku not to use it is the fact that he knew that it used up way too much power and it was probably going to cut his time on Earth down that was already very limited. So... I mean, I get it, but I, I like your point, too, that <laughs> because Goku made that decision, now it's biting him in the ass here a little bit because Vegeta doesn't want to fuse with him. Yeah, and I mean, they're in a bad situation. They're both just getting bonks in the head by Boo. And after this kind of little argument, this little blow up where where Vegeta you know completely refuses to do the fusion, uh, we see that Boo is getting bored of their bickering and... Uh, He's just going to start slapping him around again. Like he's, he's not like waiting for this couple's quarrel to, to end. <laughs> yeah. 100%, which turns into Goku. The way he finally convinces Vegeta as they've basically gotten, you know, their shit kicked in. He says, Bauman trunks are inside boo. Are you really going to let this, silly grudge that you have towards me decide the fate of your your wife your child and yourself and that is kind of the turning point for vegeto where he's like give me the stupid earring <laughs> yeah and offering out his hand and he's not happy about it at all he's reluctant about this whole thing but goku's right um if there's one thing Vegeta will fight for, if it's not for himself, it's for his family. And uh, as they're hastily putting on the earrings, this is where Goku decides to drop the truth bomb that the fusion is uh, permanent. So just like the Elder Kai, the, kind of waiting till the last second. I know you said it's a dick move, but I honestly love that gag both times that it's done. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, yeah, it's permanent. Um, but yeah, just like that, the earrings are on. Both fighters are pulled together. And a new warrior is revealed, which is episode 153, Invincible, the ultimate warrior, Vegito. So <laughs> I have something funny to say about this because I did not understand. It took me 20 years to understand why this fusion is called Vegito. Because if you look at it, I mean, Dayton, tell me, I, I have a feeling... You might not know it either, because if you look at the name Vegito, how does that, how is that a combination of Vegeta and Goku? Oh, yeah. Um, uh, because Goku has an O in it and you put that at the, I'm very confused about that. Yeah. How is that a combination? I, it took 20 years for me to fucking figure this out. It's, it's because, well, it, it, it doesn't, I, tr I thought about it. I was like, is it Vegeta and Kakarot? And I was like, no, that doesn't really make sense either. The reason it's Vegito is because in Japanese, Vegeta calls Goku Kakarato. <laughs> uh. <laughs> 20 years, man, that fucking frustrated me for 20 years and I finally pieced it together and I was like oh it makes sense now at least there's a reason for it it's not satisfying to me but at least it makes sense now what I actually really like about it once I finally figured it out is that they don't use Goku's name like because Vegeta you could argue that Vegeta is the primary in Vegito. And Vegeta will never say Goku's name, so they used Vegeta and Kakarot, and I love that. <laughs> it's pretty funny, because Goku Goku probably also doesn't really care, so he's like, what, I don't, you can call me Kakarot, I don't really care. Right. <laughs> oh my god. Sorry, I had to 
zoom in on that. I just thought it was funny. That's funny. I had no idea. Well, at least I can sleep at night now. But <laughs> what won't make me sleep at night is uh, how cocky and arrogant this new Vegito is because as soon as he opens his mouth, he starts just talking about how Boo stands no chance because this is the fusion of the two greatest Saiyans in the universe. <laughs> so we're we're bombastic, bombastic right out of the gate with this one. This is this is also kind of a funny claim to me, given the fact that as we just stated, Gohan is stronger than both of them right now. <laughs> Uh, well, I mean, if you think Gohan's dead, then technically you're Clayton. Well, dead is a weird thing in Dragon Ball. Actually, technically, isn't Vegeta dead right now? How does fusing with a dead person work? <laughs> it's interesting, too, right? Because Vegito doesn't have a halo. Like, Vegeta is dead, but Goku's alive, and Vegito doesn't have a halo. I don't know. It's weird. <laughs> I'm not, uh, it's very convoluted. Fusion's a hell of a drug, man. It's very complicated. Uh, but... I mean, Vegito starts off like he just punches in the air, like cuts across uh, Boo's face with like the wind from his punch. Uh, this is just kind of a cool scene to start off with. And they start exchanging blows pretty quick here. Um, Vegito doesn't. I mean, Boo gets in a few good hits, but Vegito seems relatively unfazed. He even makes a joke that he's kind of like working in the new body. Yeah, and, you know, even being kind of pummeled a little bit and thrown into the ground, hit with a key blast, he's... Vegito is kind of unimpressed. And this is where Boo decides to kick things up some. And, I mean, we're doing this thing where both fighters are sort of sandbagging a little bit as they build up, kind of flexing their egos. Um, but after taking a few blows, Boo powers up and summons a huge energy above him, very... Frieza-esque, and threatens to blow up the whole planet, also very Frieza-esque. And Vegeta just eggs him on and says, yeah, go for it. Go ahead and try and blow up the planet and see what happens. And, yeah, Boo goes ahead and throws it. Vegito even goes so far as to say, oh, I'll stand here and take it, and I won't even take a single step backwards. Like, the, this is part of the reason why I say Vegeta is probably, like, the primary personality in Vegito. Because this is, like, full-on cockiness and arrogance in Vegito. And, and I mean, Goku has a little bit of that in himself, too. And so when you multiply those, it is... Uh, you get the most egotistical Saiyan of all time. <laughs> yeah, I mean, at this point, Goku just believes that he can beat just about any foe sort of thing. So you've got Goku's cockiness in battle and then Vegeta's cockiness in battle and his mouth. So it's nothing about this fusion has very much humility. No, and for good reason, admittedly, because Vegito catches this ball and then just starts sprinting forward with it. And I love that he just like drop kicks it like he's playing kickball or something with it. Like yeah. he's just having a good time. Yeah, he's like a fucking pro soccer player and just launches this ball into space. It's it's pretty cool. It's pretty badass. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, Boo responds by mocking Vegito, telling him that, you know, knocking away a key blast proves nothing. And, well, Vegito decides to actually prove something and we see him pop up in a Super Saiyan, calling it Super Vegito. So thanks for labeling that. <laughs> I mean, it's not unlike uh, Super Vegeta when he fought Cell, I suppose. Uh, I, I was, I, I've always kind of been curious here if this is, if it's Super Saiyan 1 or Super Saiyan 2, because both Goku and Vegeta can go up to Super Saiyan 2, and you do see some lightning when he transforms, which is usually a iconic of Super Saiyan 2. Uh, but, I don't know. There's no mention of it. Super Saiyan 2 is probably the most forgotten about form in, in Dragon Ball. So, I think animators kind of forget the distinction between it and Super Saiyan 1. Uh, Toriyama, I think, forgets about Super Saiyan 2 sometimes. Um, he so. forgot it existed, 100%. <laughs> he thought Super Saiyan 3 was Super Saiyan 2. <laughs> Whoops-a-daisy. So, uh, yeah, it, it could be either. Um, if you have an argument, you're just as correct as the other argument. It's whatever form you want it to be. Yeah, yeah, almost certainly. Um, but this form is... 
I mean, almost immediately completely outclasses uh, Majin Buu. There's a cool shot of him like knocking one of Buu's key blasts back and Buu tucking his head like a turtle to get out of the way. Uh, and then Vegito just starts laying down the smackdown. And anything that Boo does to Vegito in this moment, completely unfazed. Yeah, and this enrages Boo as he furiously launches, you know, his own assault, letting blow after key blast, but none of it doing anything other than to provoke some arrogant smack talk from Vegito. And this is where we get to see Vegito lift his hand up in a very iconic kind of palm forward thumb kind of bent in big bang attack that smashes booze boo into bits. I do love getting to see this. It's it's always interesting to me though, because I think the original big bang attack was kind of a ball and this one's a beam, but the shit changes all the time. Yeah. I, I thought so too, but whatever it's, it's fun. Um, I, yeah, boo reforms. Uh, and when he reforms, he kind of realizes the valley of, of, like gap the valley sized gap of power between the two and we see him start just unleashing just steam just he's getting angry but i mean he's trying to do like cheap little parlor tricks now by using the steam to try and obfuscate himself so that way vegeto can't see him which of course doesn't work absolutely not i mean this is i thought this was interesting because uh we Boo actually only kind of learned how to sense energy, I think, when he turned into Evil Boo, and then Evil Boo absorbed Fat Boo, and turning into Super Boo. That was the first time that Boo really... That little that... explanation you just made is why I sometimes don't like the Boo saga. <laughs> the, the 15 forms of Boo. Uh, yeah, that's totally fair. But yes, that... Super Boo is the only form that we've seen that can sense energy. So I do kind of like Boo being a little bit ignorant to that. It's fun. Um, but I mean, I don't know. He has Vegeta absorbed into him. So why the hell wouldn't he know that? Not not Vegeta. You mean Gohan or oh, Piccolo? Uh, Piccolo or Gohan or really anybody. Because he... I don't know. Whatever. Um, yeah. But, yeah. The Smackdown continues. It's a one-sided affair. Um, Vegito at one point knocks Boo into a crater and then we see him reach out with this beam of energy that pierces Boo's battered body. And we see him kind of lift him up almost like some plucking trash from like a bin or something like that. As Boo just hangs there, just closed, just haggard and, and worn out his body just covered in bruises and blood as he just can't do anything other than just hang from this beam of energy that suspends him in the air. I love just how just, this is such a big egotistical, like, like looking down on your opponent type move that just screams the amount of arrogance that Vegito has. Yeah, 100 percent. I love this technique, too. This is Vegito's iconic spirit sword. And I, I honestly wish that this was used more. I think he uses it maybe twice or something. But uh, Boo pulls himself off of the spirit sword and then Boo goes on the assault again, this time turning his body into this kind of amorphous liquid, which we, we've seen him do this at least once before as he physically shoves and forces his body down through Vegito's throat into his body, making his body swell, just like the guy that we saw Boo explode through the same technique. And Boo basically claims, I'm going to kill you or beat you from the inside out literally and vegeto has other plans <laughs> yeah we we see vegeto's body kind of bulked up kind of it almost looks like those bulky forms we saw from like trunks in the cell saga and after a moment and with kind of a very calm demeanor we see vegeto more or less force his body kind of down into a more regular form and in doing so, it kind of squeezed Boo into a singular spot where it's this, I don't know, this like lump on Vegito's body that is more or less where Boo is at. And we see him start punching and hitting that lump and slamming him into the ground as he forces Boo to basically take a beating from the inside of his own body. So this is the start of something that I really enjoy. I want to say... 
the animation for the fight between Vegito and Boo is mediocre at best. It's honestly not that great. The fight choreography is meh. But I really like the interesting, not set pieces, just the interesting interactions in terms of the fight between Vegito and Boo. And this is one of them where Vegito com condenses Boo inside of his body to like these big lumps and then just starts hitting himself to kick Boo's ass. Like what a wild fight that is. I mean, if there's anything you have to give Boo credit for, it's he is an interesting opponent to, to try and fight, specifically fight. How do you fight something that can just change its form and be whatever it's want and absorbs people? And just, I mean, there's a lot of crazy stuff going on with him. Yeah, absolutely. And so Vegito doing this, just kind of whooping Boo's ass inside of his own body. Boo eventually gives in and then <laughs> expels himself from Vegito's mouth. Um, this results in Boo just kind of like powering up and being like, I'm done with this shit. And effectively, it, it, from Vegito's mouth, it's not, it looks like Boo is going to destroy reality or rip a hole in reality. Maybe something akin to the way that he tore a hole in reality in the hyperbolic time chamber. Yeah, it's, I mean, I don't know. It's kind of weird, I guess, that this pops up here and now, and this is really the last time we see something like this other than, I guess, I don't know, maybe in Super with like the Zamasu stuff kind of made me think of that a little bit. A little bit, yeah. I don't know. Um, But yeah, his eyes glaze over with pink and purple energy as he begins just screaming and exploding with energy. The fabric of space and time begins ripping and Vegeta is forced to step in and stop him. Uh, with some effort, so it took Vegeta, or Vegito, Vegeta and Vegito are very similar. Um, <laughs> uh, our heroes are able to interrupt the sequence by landing a blow on Boo's jaw, and the battle more or less resets at this point. Yeah, I mean, it's, I don't know, it's interesting. Um, I think, honestly, as he kind of knocks Boo out of that attack, that brings us to the end of that episode. Yeah, and that brings us into episode 154. Boo's ace in the hole. The warriors are absorbed. And things are looking bad for a taffy monster as he appears outmatched in every way. Vegito is just kind of toying with him like a cat would its prey or something like that, mocking him and never missing an opportunity to trash talk. <laughs> I honestly enjoy that about Vegito quite a bit. Uh, yeah, he, I mean, speaking of taffy, Vegito, like, punches Boo while holding his antenna to full-on stretch him out, and Boo kind of, like, wraps himself around Vegito, constricting him. Vegito easily breaks out of it, just turning Boo into a bunch of gummy parts. Um, but none of this is enough to get rid of Boo. He just kind of pulls himself back together. And... I mean... Vegito should be able to easily wipe Boo out, but... He's just giving Boo the opportunity to try to give him a good fight. And this turns into Boo spitting out a bunch of kamikaze ghosts. Oh, yeah. I love this. So Boo spits out five of these little kamikaze ghosts. And Vegeta's already seen this technique, right? Um, Goku watched it through the crystal ball. And so he knows all about this technique. And when this ghost squadron attacks, we see Vegito kind of create some distance. And then he focuses all these little key blasts into each of his fingertips, firing them out, each one finding its own separate target, more or less nullifying this attack. So we get to see kind of the hard counter to it, right? You just poke them and they explode. So you do it from a distance. Well, this is where Boo reveals that. Yeah, like that's how a child would use the technique. Let's try the more mature version. And we see 10 more of these ghosts summoned out this time. But rather than just going in on the assault like they previously did, they hold up mid-charge and we see them pulling their arms back, forming Kamehameha waves, which is really fun. Yeah, it's interesting. The... I don't know. I have some weird feelings about this. Uh, I like that it's different. I, <laughs> I also want to point out, I like... With Vegeta and Goku being combined, I like how, like, cocky and confident 
Vegito is, but there are moments when he's surprised where he gets the full on like goofy Goku facial expressions where he's like, oh shit. And I, I love the way those are animated uh, as he's trying to like fly and run away from these Kamehameha uh, balls that now are chasing him. I mean, it's it's fun. And we're taking kind of like how we talked about Krillin's Destructo Disc earlier. I like seeing that adaptation of a technique. Like, all right, what's the next thing you do with it? And so these little ghosts, they fire out these Kamehameha waves. I assume that they're not nearly as powerful as one launched by, you know, Goku or the the fighter himself. But they more or less do the job of putting pressure on. Um, Vegito is forced to flee through some rocky crevices where three other ghosts jump out and go to fire Masenko's out of all the techniques they could have chosen. <laughs> um, and so Vegito is caught between kind of the collision of all these Kamehameha waves and the Masenko blast. And there's this huge explosion. And for a microsecond, you think Vegito was defeated, but uh, no, Boo is suddenly blasted into bits and uh, Vegito has instant transmission. So it's cool. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. I Anytime there are clones or copies uh, in that sort of technique, we've always kind of been told that they are weaker than the original, kind of like what you said, Dayton. So I don't know. It just doesn't feel... The Ghost Kamikaze... I like how the Ghost Kamikaze attack itself acts, but just having them like basically act as copies and then fire techniques it doesn't feel very new or original i guess i don't know either way it's it's nice that boo is trying to iterate on one technique that is already a stolen technique i guess yeah i dig it where dragon ball has a problem with not having enough interesting techniques so i'll take anything i can get at this point that's um, definitely fair it's better than just another named beam attack I'm not gonna, not gonna argue with you on that one for sure. Uh, this does turn into Boo kind of putting himself back together and then going on the assault. And Vegito at some point is just full on has his arms crossed and is like blocking Boo's attacks with his feet and says, "Yeah, I could probably beat you with one leg." <laughs> yeah. And he does. He starts fighting with just his right leg, and it's kind of funny. Um, I... This is where Supreme Kai who's watching from the world of the Kais more or less foreshadows that nothing good is going to come from all the showboating. And I like that he kind of mentions this um, because yeah, nothing good comes from all the showboating. Um, <laughs> but I don't, this is where we get another claim of boo screaming about being the mightiest warrior in the universe. Um, eh. Every single time he does it, I want to, <sighs> Yeah, I, I just want him to not be on screen. I hate it so much. Um, I do kind of like the the Vegito not using his arms thing is like a parallel to Frieza doing the same thing to Goku, which is kind of fun. Um, v Vegito, well, sorry, Boo at this point, you kind of get the impression that he's got some sort of idea because he starts smiling and he's like, Come on, fight me. Let's go. And you're like, what the what is going on here? And the moment that Vegito kind of closes the distance, Boo makes some quip about turning him into candy and immediately does so at point blank range, uses his antenna to shoot out his candy beam and hits Vegito, turning him into a hard coffee candy. Yeah, and Boo starts laughing just maniacally, thinking the battle is over. He's even describing how he's going to eat Vegito at this point, how he's going to savor it and then crush down at the last moment. But uh, this is all cut short because the battle isn't over as Boo punches himself in the face. I love this so much. This, there are a lot of elements of this fight that I like. This might be my favorite one. <laughs> <laughs> Because we find out the reason Boo punched himself in the face is that Vegeta is so fucking powerful that even as a piece of candy, he starts whooping Boo's ass. Yeah, I mean, we see this this piece of candy just flying around in circles. Boo is trying to catch it and swing at it. This Even a point where Vegeta's circling Boo so quickly that... 
Boo starts just swinging wildly, trying to hit whatever he can. And you see the piece of candy just stop for a moment, just watching Boo just flailing in the air before going back to swinging around Boo. It's hilarious. I think it's hilarious. I mean, you talk about Looney Tunes. This is that scene is very Looney Tunes, and I honestly really enjoy it. Uh, I mean, the the candy is like hitting Boo. Boo, uh, I mean, effectively can't get his hands on it. The one moment that he does get his hands on it, the candy like shoves, takes Boo's hand and shoves it in his mouth and then starts like banging it around. Um, and there's even one point where the candy Vegito gets away from Boo and then says, oh, you want to eat me? Here, have this. And then shoots through the back, like through Boo's mouth, out the back of his head, uh, chopping off the antenna once more. But Boo basically has to fill the hole through the back of his head now. Yeah, it's it's pretty funny. It's, I don't know, Boo gets smacked around so much that he more or less is forced to turn Vegito back to his original form. And it makes sense. I don't think you would ever be able to catch a little piece of candy like that flying around you. At least when he's back in his original form, it's a larger target. You can, you might be able to hit something. I, I'm honestly having a hard time thinking of any way that you could better express the vast power difference between two characters. <laughs> like you just got your ass beat by a jawbreaker, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, I don't know. It, it, at this point with Vegito back in his original form, Boo Smackdown continues. And I mean, he's beaten, he's blasted, he's verbally roasted. Um, the music fantastic during this beatdown. It sounds like an original Falconer score with the bells and those futuristic kind of sci-fi beats. I don't know. It's it's the perfect kind of uh, backdrop to this scene. That's a good point. I, I actually did want to, because I've been bagging on the Kai music quite a bit. Most of these episodes have pretty good use of music. There's even a few tracks that I didn't even recognize that I was like, oh, that, that slaps. That's a real good track for that scene. Yeah, and I... I I only like putting out music if it's really good or really bad. Um, and this this is just one of those ones where I don't know if this is the original score or not from um, the original run, but I don't know. It works here. It's great. I love that that Falconer, you know, futuristic crazy beats. Yeah, yeah. Props to them for that. I I agree with you. That's that was really well done. Um, this kind of culminates in. Vegito knocking Boo around, uh, blasting him with multiple key blasts and attacks. I was kind of watching for, because I thought, and maybe I just missed it, but I don't think I did. I thought that uh, Vegito fired off a final Kamehameha, like a final flash Kamehameha combo, but I I tried to find it on YouTube later, and I was like, oh, he doesn't. He does in Super as... uh, Super Saiyan Blue Vegito, but I couldn't find it. Did you see it in here at all? I don't remember seeing it. I also had the same thought where I was waiting for something like that to happen. So I feel like it's got to be in the original or something like that. We just missed it or can't find it. Um, That's something I'm going to have to, after this, I'm going to have to see if I can track that down and figure out what what's up with that. Because I feel like that existed before Super. I thought so too. I mean, I know it's in the games. It's in. I saw it's in all of the old games. Um, I don't know. Maybe I just kind of superimposed it as being in the original scene with Vegito, or maybe I just remembered it from the video games. But it's possible. Um, but we don't have much time here because Boo only has ten seconds to say his prayers at this point because Vegito doesn't have any more time to mess around. He's bored, and. Boo is now pushed to make a desperate sneak attack, utilizing a, a piece of him that was severed off his body earlier, very similar to uh, Gohan. He sneaks up behind Vegito with it, and yeah, there's an interesting internal monologue where Vegito recognizes that this is all part of his plan, and then Boo absorbs Vegito, covering him with his pink gook, but just before this happens, we hear him use some sort of barrier technique, I believe. Yeah, I want to focus in on this for a moment because 
this is this feels to me like the Vegeta the Vegeta scene with King Yama where I feel like they're tipping their hand too too early because this I'm 99% sure in the original Funimation dub that we were given no indication that Vegito had planned something here. We basically were kind of the audience was left with this impression that oh shit, Vegito just got absorbed by Boo. Now what's going to happen? But this basically gives us the idea that oh, Vegito's going into this knowing that this is what he planned. Like there's it, it lacks tension as a result. Yeah, I mean it my thing though is that everything that's happening after this point is weird. So, um, I guess I agree with you. Um, I do think that it does kind of take some of the tension away, but from my perspective, all this crap that happens after this is weird anyway. So I'm more distracted by that. Yeah, that's fair. I will get into it, but I, I'm 95% sure most of what happens in this next episode is, is filler is is not canon to the manga i mean we can go through it pretty quick because there's really only a few things that really happen here that are important um yeah. none of the fighting that we're going to talk about is worth talking about um it's all very kind of generic -y, feels like reused um animations that sort of thing um there's yeah. one fight moment I want to point out, but it's it's quick. Okay. Um. So this episode kicks off. Boo's gloating and celebrating his victory, and he's gonna go get something to eat. Um. He thinks of it that something's off, but whatever. He doesn't care. And this is where we cut to inside Boo's body, where you know we see the just a web of pink and purple connective tissue and cells. It's it's a weird place to be. Um. But we find what I assume is the microform of Vegeta, whose body is covered with that energy barrier thing he had mentioned. And we find out that his plan was to find the other fighters inside Boo and rescue them. I mean, I, I don't hate this plan. I just don't like that they kind of revealed their hand early. Uh, I, I like kind of leaving the audience with this idea that, oh, oh shit, Vegito got absorbed. Uh, as we kind of dive into this scene, Vegito drops his barrier, thinking like, okay, I'm going to need to, you know, move around here and figure out where everybody is. And the moment, this is, this is important to me, because the moment that he drops his barrier is the exact moment that Vegito splits back into his component parts of Vegeta and Goku. And they kind of say, they're like, must be something weird about being inside of Boo's body that's not letting the Patara earrings work inside here. And I'm going to continue to say, I hate that they retconned this in Dragon Ball Super, where they were like, oh yeah, you can use the Patara earrings, they only last for 30 minutes, just like the dance. <laughs> yeah, the, the Patara fusion was supposed to be more powerful, but it has that obvious downside of you, once you, you know, once you go fusion... Uh, I don't, I can't rhyme that. Once you go fusion, you can't go back. Um, I don't know. It's just really weird. It's also, I don't know, like it breaks them apart, but like the go tanks fusion doesn't break apart. I don't, there's so many rules that just, there's always caveats and all this other, it's so convoluted that this is my nitpick with the freaking boo stuff is that everything is like, there's not an overarching story. It's just we establish a rule and then break it immediately and move on to the next thing that we're going to break. And we're just, we're flying through it. Nothing makes sense. Everything's made up. I I, I mean, I've, I've kind of been ripping on these episodes in particular. I think once you get to the part, basically once Gohan becomes irrelevant, that is the part where the Boo arc takes a huge nosedive for me. It does pick itself back up towards the tail end for me, but this chunk is just... even. I love Vegito. I love a lot of the fight pieces for Vegito against Boo, but almost everything else surrounding that 
element of the story and everything else going on is is convoluted is lots of rules being broken lots of nonsensical bs <laughs> yeah and we're i don't know B boo is a character that's constantly changing and has weird motivations and to make things even worse vegeta and goku are back in their original forms and decide that they're going to destroy their patara earrings so those are destroyed no longer an option there was Vegeta particularly was the one who kind of encouraged that because Goku was like, oh, we can use them later. And Vegeta was like, I'm not going to be a part of you again. <laughs> <laughs> so with that gone, um, all we know is that uh, Boo is flying off to eat his celebratory cakes. Um, and while they're wandering through Boo, they come across these kind of fleshy pods that are housing all their unconscious friends. And so, yeah, they find Goten, Trunks, Gohan, um, Piccolo, and they begin kind of setting all of their friends and family free at this point, or at least them. Yeah, yeah, and this results in Boo, I mean, I guess back on Earth or outside of his body, he he starts reverting back to his, if you want to call it his standard Super Boo form without the nose and with the shorter antenna, and then he starts, like, kind of almost thinking inwardly uh, and then manifests a version of himself inside <laughs> so of weird. himself. Yeah. Um, I also want to mention that uh, our heroes come across uh, the flesh pot of the pudgy Majin Buu. So that's in there as well. And Boo is now a little Boo inside Boo. And yeah, the, Goku and Vegeta have to do battle with the little Boo inside Boo. And I mean, the battle is kind of boring. Um, even Super Boo is kind of yawning and not really into this fight. Um, the one neat thing that happens, though, is that when Boo gets knocked around in here, he'll like dissolve and absorb back into the ground and walls and stuff like that because it's all his own body. So he's kind of like, like, he is everything, so he can be anywhere, which is... I like that aspect of it. It's kind of neat. Yeah. Yeah, I don't disagree. The The only part that I really enjoyed about this that had me laughing out loud was where Boo grabs Goku and Vegeta by the head, slams them together, and Vegeta says... Is your head made out of marble? And I just started dying laughing, particularly because Goku, in so many of his fights, physically uses his head to harm or even defeat many of his opponents. I mean, did he defeat Piccolo that way? Yeah. <laughs> That's so funny. Yeah, Goku probably is the hardest head in Dragon Ball. One of them. Maybe. Yeah. I just thought it was fun. I, I loved that callback to him physically using his head quite often <laughs> that's pretty funny yeah uh goku and vegeta fight boo um who they keep hitting him with energy blasts and attacks and everything but he keeps popping back into form basically healing from anything they can launch and that leads us into episode 156 emergency escape from the body boo's retrogression into evil and i mean vegeta is screaming at boo who's just kind of laughing and trying to get him to shut up and begins firing off a flurry of key attacks that of course do nothing and then goku tries some key blasts of his own that also do nothing and i mean boo is doing stuff like summoning giant arms from the floor and trying to smash them and things like that it's i mean it's not a very interesting fight but there's a couple interesting things that are happening yeah, I think kind of the important part here as th this portion comes to a close is Goku starts like firing off a bunch of blasts and the moment that one of them comes close to the pod that's holding Fat Boo, our internal Super Boo uh, puts his himself bodily in front of the blast to take it instead of it hitting the pod. And Vegeta clocks this and is like, oh, oh, I'm going to rip that pot out. <laughs> yeah. Vegeta gets his hands on the pot and he begins pulling on it, just kind of taunting Super Brew, just asking him like, oh, well, I don't think you would like it if I if I pulled this down now, would you? 
And Super Boo begins panicking, screaming at him not to do it, and mentions that he won't be himself anymore if he does. And Vegeta doesn't question this. He just smiles and rips the pod free, and we see Super Boo begin screaming in agony as he falls and starts dissolving into the floor. Yeah, I... This gets us away from maybe one of the weirder parts in the Boo arc, because Goku and Vegeta now are basically just flying with the pods, trying to find an exit, and they eventually find one of the steam holes in Majin Buu that... I kind of like this as being their exit. We kind of already know that this is an established part of Boo's physiology, and so they exit out through one of the steam holes and find themselves back in their normal sized forms outside of Boo's body. Yeah, and once they exit, we are shown the the kind of screaming in agony form of Boo as he convulses and we see his muscles kind of like bulging out and then shrinking back and I I believe Goku or somebody mentions that his power level is just rocketing while all this is happening. And what was once this tall, muscular form, we see it kind of collapse in on itself as it almost seems like Boo's fighting this transformation as it's happening. Um, but eventually the transformation completes and we're left with this really small form of Boo, much more slender and childlike in proportions. And finally, we're revealed the monstrous final form of Kid Boo. This is, I, I mean, Kabito Kai is basically saying like, oh no, he's going back to his original form. And the Supreme Kai is the only one who is, I think the only one that we know who saw Boo in his original form, like when he was created by Bibbidi. But Goku and Vegeta are like, oh, you know, he's he's smaller. It seems like he's probably weaker. Like, this is great. We'll be, we could probably whoop this Boo's ass. Uh, and they kind of set their friends aside and they get ready to take on this form of Boo. Yeah, and the first thing this form of Boo does is scream, and it shakes the entire planet as we go into episode 157. Earth destroyed the initial Boo's nefarious strike. And we cut back over to Kabito Kai, like you called him, and this is where he, this is where we get all the deets of what's going on with this new form of Boo. And I'm going to try and skim through this because there's, it's kind of a big lore dump at this point. Um, yeah, but more or less back when all the Supreme Kai's of the universe had different regions that they were still in charge of, uh, Bibbidi, which we get images of Bibbidi here. So that was something that I briefly talked about in a different episode, but we have them. I know what he looks like. Um, he created this version of Boo and he began using this version to destroy the universe. The Supreme Kai scrambled together to battle Boo, but they were more or less all, or, easily defeated with the exception of our Supreme Kai that we know Boo absorbed the Supreme Kai of the South and um, nearly killed the current Supreme Kai. That is until the grand Supreme Kai stepped in to save his life and battled Boo, but he himself was also eventually absorbed, which triggered a transformation into the overweight pudgy Majin Boo that we all know and love. This transformation took the reckless killing machine and tempered his anger anger and reckless destruction and turned him into a more childlike being. Um, when Majin Buu was freed from Super Buu, it reverted him back to his original form of this reckless monster of chaos and destruction, a savage beast of unrestrained evil. I mean, like you said, with Buu's different forms and transformations and stuff, some of this is weird and maybe doesn't make sense. This... I think that this one makes the least sense to me because <laughs> I don't even know if I can explain this. So because Fat Boo, which was basically Kid Boo plus a few of those Supreme Kais, expelled the evil from him, creating the gray, skinny, evil Boo, and then evil Boo absorbed Fat Boo, creating Super Boo, we get... Super Boo having Fat Boo removed from him, to me, that should create Evil Boo. 
the gray kind of skinny gangly form but for whatever reason it creates the original kid boo i mean i guess you could argue that maybe something about connecting fat boo back with him left some sort of trace or essence on evil boo and made the kid boo i don't know that part to me is the part that makes the least sense i have no clue i can't follow all these transformations <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm just going to go with whatever they tell me because th this shit's too complicated. Like we're jumping forms. Like it's going out of style right now. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> they even briefly show the like bulked up form of kid boo from when he had absorbed one of the like big bulky Supreme Kai's and then m moves down from that to normal kid boo. So that's, that's even fucking weirder. I don't know. <laughs> All right, we'll we'll have to make a flow chart or something. Maybe maybe it does make sense, but I can't figure it out right now. <laughs> yeah, but we kind of continue forward as I'm not gonna lie, this is my favorite version of Kid Boo because this Kid Boo gives or this version of Boo gives no fucks. He immediately fires off a key blast that is intended to destroy the earth. And the only reason it doesn't is because Vegeta knocks the blast away with his own key blast. Yeah, and I mean, Kid Buu is just smiling widely while he's doing this. But the most important part, this is the part where I think um, this Boo has a very distinct personality that I like, where he's non-communicative. He's kind of this reckless beast who they're talking to him. But he's not saying anything back. He's just on a mission to just destroy and is reckless and is unstoppable. I like I love it. I freaking love that this is the boo that we we end up with here. Kid Boo is best boo. I <laughs> I dislike Super Boo even more after we've watched all this stuff that made him feel very much like Cell. But having Kid Boo who is just like you said non-communicative, he doesn't care about anything except just destruction and i that makes him unique that makes him different from the other characters the other bad guys that we've had up to this point and he turns on goku and vegeta who are like hey you you owe us a fight and kid boo's like nah fuck that and pulls up this gigantic gigantic key blast overhead and launches it directly at Goku and Vegeta as well as the earth. Yeah. And Goku and Vegeta are actually forced to flee from this monster. And the plan is grab who you can, and we're going to instant transmission off world. And the blast is barreling down on them so quickly that they really don't have time to grab everybody and find a place to lock onto. So Goku can teleport out. And kind of in the final second, we see the Supreme Kai appear, kind of manifest right in front of them with his hand extended out. And just in the nick of time, our heroes are teleported off planet. And it's a good thing because when this key blast hits the planet, it obliterates it, killing every everyone who is left on the planet. And unfortunately, um, some of our current heroes are killed with the planet. We find out that Goku managed to only grab Dende, Mr. Satan, and Puppers. I really like this scene. The tension here is fantastic. Everything feels... Nothing feels contrived. Uh, I mean, you could maybe argue that, you know, Goku says, I need more time to, to focus on the instant transmission, but... He's doing a lot of things. He's grabbing people. He's trying to get away from this ball. He's trying to, you know, get to Gohan and Goten and Trunks um, so that he can, and Piccolo, so that he can grab them. And so I, I like the way they build the tension here. I like that this creates a scenario for Kabito Kai or Supreme Kai to actively be useful because he's been pretty fucking useless up to this point. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I like that they, I believe they already established that the Kai's teleportation is effectively a step up, a step above and better than standard instant transmission. So everything here feels like we're, we're sticking to rules that have been established and all of this feels good and makes sense. 
speaking of making sense, I like that there's a moment where Hercules kind of filled in on the situation that's happening, who the Supreme and Grand Kai's are, and kind of the state of the universe. And his response is that, well, they're doing a lousy job. And that also, this is all a dream. It's just a dream. I'm going to go fly and take down that Majin Buu myself. <laughs> <laughs> um, off to the side, though, Vegeta calls Goku an idiot for saving uh, Dende and Hercule rather than saving his own family. And I mean, I can only imagine that, yeah, Goku probably internally feels the same way, but I don't think Goku really had a choice. I think he was just grabbing whoever to get out. I love this. Yeah, and I, I agree with you. It, you kind of get the impression that Dende and Mr. Satan were closer and kind of on the way to getting Gohan, Goten, and Trunks. But you also, you could kind of subtly read this as Vegeta being pissed off that Goku didn't save his son. Not, not well, I mean, both Goku's children, but specifically Vegeta's son, Trunks. Yeah, and I, I definitely got the same vibes from that, but... I mean, the decision's already been made, and it wasn't like there was much time to really think about it, so I I don't know. I get Vegeta's anger, and he's got to take out his frustration somewhere. Yeah, and I mean, there's there's like a... There's something in there, there's a part of me that's like, it makes sense for him to save Dende in a way, uh, because no Dende means no Dragon Balls, and I mean, I guess no Earth means no Dragon Balls too, but... If they find some way around that, at least they've got Dende, who could, you know, either maybe you could make some more Dragon Balls. Who knows? It, Dende's a good, a good, I don't want to say pawn. He's a good piece on the chessboard to have. And this piece on the chessboard points out that they could use the Namekian Dragon Balls to undo everything, huh? Huh? I bet you nobody but all of us viewers thought of that. <sighs> <laughs> One of my biggest pet peeves about Dragon Ball is how many fucking sets of Dragon Balls there are. <laughs> Dude, even the the Elder Kai is upset about the Dragon Balls. He yells at them that the Dragon Balls were a breach of the natural order and weren't supposed to exist, which I love that. I love that he just... He tells them that the Dragon Balls were kind of... They made an exception for the Namekians because of how disciplined they were. I like that a lot, too. I, I mean, these... These are these are the gods, right? Like they are basically saying, like, no, no Dragon Balls, they shouldn't even exist. And the way they get around, I mean, <laughs> we we've talked about these uh, these pervy gags oh, before. No. This is, I'm not gonna lie, this is the only time that I kind of like it. I don't like that it's a pervy gag necessarily, but I like that Goku is trying to find some way to get around it and be like. Hey, God, do you want to overlook the fact that we're messing with the natural order of things and using these balls to kind of fix all of our mistakes? <laughs> yeah. Yep. And I don't know. He, whatever. He's offered, he offers pictures of Bulma to the Elder Kai in exchange for allowing them to use the Dragon Balls, which, I mean, I don't know. At this point, man, the natural order is all screwed up with Boo running around. Why, why the hell would you care about that? Yeah, uh, this this does kind of work in Goku's favor. It is kind of funny seeing Vegeta, though, be like, hey, Kakarot, are you talking about Balma? And he's like, why don't you why don't you let this old man peep on your wife instead of mine, you asshole? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's I don't know. It's it's pretty funny. It's a fair point. Uh, yeah, actually, now that I think about it. Yeah, that is really funny that he keeps offering up Vegeta's wife. And this time, right in front of him. Yeah, I I like that it's at least addressed that Vegeta's like, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> oh, it's kind of funny. But we cut over to uh, Earth space, where Earth once was, and we see that Boo has reformed, and he's all better now. And on top of that, he can use the instant transmission since he saw Goku use it. And so he starts just teleporting from planet to planet, destroying them. We have universal Armageddon upon us now. Yeah, and he starts destroying them with little care whatsoever. I I think this is kind of a cool scene where Majin Buu teleports to the Grand Kai's world, 
which we actually get to see dead Krillin and dead Yamcha. I'm not going to lie. Maybe I shouldn't even get into this, but I, I had to think in my head like, okay, so if people get eaten by Majin Buu, they're considered dead. They're not like absorbed like the other guys because we see Yamcha and Krillin here who have halos. They're specifically in the other world. Uh, regardless, Boo's here to destroy this planet and kill them once more. <laughs> okay, so I don't know if you had like this thought like I did, but I always assumed that like other world was literally like a different dimension that people were in. It's like the afterlife dimension or something like that. So it was really weird to me that Boo shows up on a planet where all these dead people are. It's it's always been kind of intermingled in a weird way. Like I I get what you mean, but this is not the first time that we've seen that. I'm you know what? Uh, I'm trying to remember exactly in the Saiyan arc, Goku has to go from King Kai's planet back across Snake Way. I can't remember if he actively gets teleported, though, from, like, King Yemma's place to Earth, or if he just fucking flies it out. Um, but if you think about King Kai's planet, when Cell is going to explode, Goku just instant transmissions to King Kai's planet, so... So, <sighs> those... The, the planet of the Kais makes sense to me, at least, like, King Kai's planet and... Um, well, the planet of the Kais, because I assumed that those were seats of the Kais to kind of overlook um, the different sectors of their universe. Whereas I don't know, like other world feels like it's a different universe sort of thing. So I don't know. I think I see the distinction that you're making. I it's it's so tricky because. I mean, King Yemma's place, which is connected to King Kai's planet via Snake Way, is literally the check-in station for the dead, right? Like, you see spirits there, you see dead people checking in there all the time. Uh, so that... It's a weird intermingling of, like... They almost just consider these, like planets within the same universe it's it, it's such a strange interpretation yeah, because that's kind of my thing is like all right when you die you don't go to like the afterlife you go to this other planet actually <laughs> yeah so, like when you die you become an alien i guess kind of yeah you're not exactly wrong <laughs> I, don't know. I wasn't ready for for this level of thought when i got to this point i'm just like and i'll never know so i guess i just accept that when you travel around the universe you could just come on come shoot over to the planet of the dead, I guess. Yeah. It, well, it's actually, a I think very... they say that this is, is this the Grand Kai's planet is what they say? They do, which could kind of be considered separate from like, if you want to say like heaven or hell, because this is only the place where people who get to keep their bodies are. So maybe there's that distinction of like spirit realm versus like people who physically have their bodies just go to a different planet. I don't know. Maybe that's that's the distinction I needed is that this is a planet and they're brought from the dead to this planet to to fight or spar or whatever they want to do in the Grand Kais. I'll go with that. That's at least some logic that I can follow. When he showed up and a bunch of dead people were there, I was just like, how, how the hell did he just instant transmission to like the the other world? Like, what the hell? Yeah, it's a little confusing. That's the best explanation i have for it <laughs> um but i think it kind of takes us into the next episode it does which is episode 158 a final showdown at the summit face off in the world of the kais and um elder kai suggests using supreme kai's patara earrings to fuse goku and vegeta once more but uh this time it's goku who actually refuses to use them and Vegeta, of course, agrees with him. And for some reason, both of them crush this set of earrings. Like, just hand them back, you jerks. Oh, shit. Did they crush them again? Yeah. I totally forgot about yeah, that. Yeah, they crushed the other set of earrings. Those are those are dust. They just, right in front of them, like, hey, do you, do you want to, you guys should use this. And they take them, they go, no thanks, and then destroy them. <laughs> 
I forgot that they crushed them. That's hilarious. <laughs> like the first I, time they get it, I get it because it's kind of like their commitment, their resolve, right? Like we're not going to use these crush. But the second set, you're just being a jerk now. Yeah, I mean, the Kai's are right there. They literally just could have handed them back. I, I forgot about that little detail, but that's that's hilarious. Um, I do kind of like, though, the... Uh, I mean, it's dumb in a way, but I like the whole Saiyan pride aspect of like, ah, this guy, Boo's not fused with anybody, so it wouldn't be fair to do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we got to give him a fair fight, right? Yeah, uh, obviously. Oh, man. Um, but we do cut back over to Boo, though, who is on the uh, the Grand Kai's planet or whatever planet it is. And we see him screaming much like he did on Earth, um, shaking the entire planet. And this is where we see my boy Krillin leaping into action, chopping Boo in half with a sweet Destructo disc. This animation looked awful, by the way. This is some of the worst animation of any fighting I've seen of Krillin jumping yeah. in. It's like three different images. And that's it. That's the whole thing you get. It's real bad, yeah. I I completely agree. You can tell they were really phoning it in with this one. They're like, ah, this scene doesn't matter. Uh, and then Krillin full on gets gets his ass beat. He gets uh, owned. Krillin gets owned. This is yeah. Krillin owned counter number fifty at this point. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, I I like that Krillin again. This is this is not as impactful as the scene where he stood up for like eighteen and everybody else on the lookout. But props to fucking Krillin for knowing that he's going to get his ass handed to him and still stepping up to the plate to bat regardless. Yeah, and um, I'm going to tie this point into the point that Vegeta and Goku kind of bring up next, is that um, if Boo kills any of the people on this planet, they're gone for good. They're already dead, so once you lose your body in the afterlife, like, you're donezo. You stop existing and so, I don't know if Krillin knew that or not when he jumped into action, but if he did, that is one brave SOB. 100%. And the plan that they come up with, they're like, well, at first they're going to teleport to the Grand Kai's planet, and then they're like, nah, there's going to be... There's too many people there. It's, it's going to be too, too busy, too complicated, too many people we have to worry about. Let's get him to come to us. And they decide to just start powering up to basically create this beacon of energy for Boo to hone in on. Yeah, and of course, Boo locks right onto their energy. He immediately gives up on destroying the planet he's on, thankfully. And um, I was shocked he didn't just like like throw a planet-destroying key blast out just for good measure before he left, but um, he's got bigger fish to fry, and I don't think there's a lot of brain activity happening with this kind of evil beast. And he teleports off scene and instantly arrives at the world of the Kais. And I mean, about all we know is that um, Boo is here. Dende, Supreme Kai, and Elder Kai have all teleported off scenes. That way the Saiyans can kind of fight all out. Um, I do like that um, Elder Kai mentions before he leaves that this planet is sturdy, so don't hesitate to go all out. So we're not getting another Namek situation here. That is pretty funny, but uh, we'll see that it, it starts to resemble Namek here pretty quickly. The uh, one thing I do want to point out about this, too, is that you mentioned the, the animation for Krillin's scene. The animation through this episode, probably about one third of the way through, once Boo shows up on the planet of the Kais, goes, it's night and day. It is <laughs> like, these are our f team animators to these are our s team animators and it is gorgeous throughout the rest of this episode <laughs> yeah um and yeah we'll i'll get into it more once we get to some of these scenes because they they are excellent um i love though that we get a very dragon ball moment right at the the kickoff here of the big fight with goku and vegeta uh playing rock paper scissors to see who's gonna have the first crack at boo and, I mean, this is typical Dragon Ball. This gag has happened a couple of times now. I mean, the the setup for this, though, is perfect because the Kais, they kind of teleport off the planet and they're watching and they're like, uh, I think the Kabito Kai is like, do you think they can do it? And the, the Grand Kai is like, 
yeah, they, you know, I, I think they might have a chance if they both work together. And as they're watching, they immediately see Goku and Vegeta doing rock, paper, scissors to see who gets to fight. <laughs> It's so good. The setup is so good. The delivery is so good. This is that is like a Dragon Ball gag at its finest. Yeah, that 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 scene was good. Full props to them. Full marks. Um, but Goku begins powering up, and Kid Buu begins kind of beating his chest and I don't know, like grunting. And it's at around this point too, though, that Supreme Kai realizes that he forgot uh, Mister Satan Puppers on this probably doomed planet. So. <laughs> cool like that's uh that's another i mean the dragon ball gags are sometimes like silly and goofy that's a, i think that one's on brand i'm i'm totally on board for that one and it's gonna it's gonna have some serious payoff as we move forward yeah and he, this is where we get to see the animation full form as goku goes on the attack in what looks like super saiyan 2 form i mean it's got the electricity and stuff right that's super saiyan 2 I think so. I'm even kind of scrubbing through it just to see the the look because he starts off in Super Saiyan, but then I think when he's actually fighting, yeah, he's in he's in Super Saiyan too. Okay. Uh, we see him land a couple of punches and kicks on Kid Buu, and then runs. He runs him through with a point blank key blast that kind of. I mean, I love the way he pushes in, presses up the key blast right against Kid Buu's stomach, and then just annihilates him in the entire backdrop. And Boo is left kind of in a pink cloud that's forced to reform afterwards. It, the whole sequence is great. 100%. This is fucking gorgeous. Like, it's it's wild to me that Gohan fighting Boo did not get this sort of respect on it. Vegito fighting Boo did not get this sort of respect yeah, on it. Yeah, yeah. But, but that's the part that really surprises me because that was supposed to be like a big deal. Yeah, definitely. But this, this fight, I think this is one of the things that uh, I remember very fondly about the Boo arc because this fight is gorgeous. And we're only like touching the, the tip of the iceberg here as uh, Boo kind of gets back up and they they kind of exchange like clashing key blasts together. And then... They go in and start exchanging blows. Goku throws a kick that Boo full on turtle heads down underneath. And then Goku does manage to land a blow that Boo gets knocked back and then fucking extends his body out to like parachute and catch himself. Absolutely stunning choreography throughout all of this fight. It's incredible. And I mean, there's like even a shot where Goku kind of like leapfrogs over a, a, a key blast. And, like, I don't know, just, I don't know why, just the animation for it is great. And then after this, we see Boo kind of stomping his foot into the ground, where his leg, I guess, goes through the ground and fires up, kind of attacking Goku from below with his leg, firing it through the ground. Which is super cool, by the way. Like, all these attacks come up from the ground from Boo's, like, extended leg. And then Goku, of all things is watching the the attacks from the feet and then like steps on the foot to throw off Boo's rhythm and then lunges forward with his own attack incredible incredible choreography like if i could have these sorts of fights in dragon ball all the time i'd lose my mind and it's an incredibly fun fight too right it's all this weird stuff that's happening it's animated well but everything's still in character everyone's kind of fighting the way that you would expect them to fight so not not only is it a fun fight but it kind of it still fits the the theme of everything that's happening absolutely yeah i i mean We've talked about the the fact that Boo is just a really cool character in terms of the way that people have to fight him. And even, like, Boo gets kind of tossed away from Goku, and Boo uses his antenna, just lets it, like, extend out, staying in place behind him to grab Goku around the neck and then swing Goku around with his antenna and launches him into the rocks, um, after which Goku, like, Moses just parts the sea of the mountain around him with his energy. 
all of this is incredible. Like, I, I cannot say enough good things about this fight. Yeah, it's funny because I feel like if if we don't get this fight, then I'm very negative about this set of episodes because th there's been a lot of fighting, but so much of it has been kind of subpar animation. The Vegito stuff was fine. The Gohan stuff was terrible. Um, I I needed this, man. Like, this was like a shot of adrenaline into my arm watching all this. So I... I'm usually the one who kind of like goes through and divides up the episodes for us for each podcast episode for our listeners who don't know. I almost cut the episode. This is the last episode that we're doing for this, uh, the last episode of Kai that we're covering for this podcast episode. And I almost cut us off one episode before. And I'm so glad that I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, the fight, we're not done talking about the fighting. It's, it continues. Um, we see Boo rocket into the air, and then he descends down onto Goku at just insane speed as they pick up their battle. And the force of the impact causes the ground to kind of shake and splinter and begin raising in some areas and lowering in others as, like, the earth itself around them begins kind of uh, morphing and changing and splintering under the weight of their battle. And also, it's at around this point that I noticed that the music yes. is slapping right now with electric guitar and rock and roll and just occasional chanting. The music is awesome here. I have no idea where this track came from. It is incredible. It is so good for this fight. It is playing like this awesome rock music uh, with I, don't, I can't even I couldn't even tell what language it was and that they were singing in the background, but it fits the scene so well. It gets you so hyped up for what is already a super hype combat. And I, I mean, yeah, the, the fight just kind of continues on with Boo launching a key blast at like a massive key ball at Goku. Goku deflecting it off into space and you see it literally circle around the planet and then come back down towards Goku to which he has to dodge the attack and it piles down into the planet, creating almost a planet Namek scenario. <laughs> I will say Goku's original dodge of that key blast is this gorgeously animated, like spinning gorilla vault he does over it. I don't know why. It just looks so every little thing about this looks good. And it I mean if they're if the artists and the animators are going to spend that much time putting this much detail into it. I'm going to take the time to call it out because every little thing in this looks fantastic. And that planet Namek scenario you're talking about, the way that um, what was once like a very Earth, like the blues and whites and the background and skies and stuff like that, all that that color palette takes a severe change as we get a very similar vibe to Namek, right? With the black skies, with hues of red, and we even get the lightning bolts that I think of every time I think of Goku going Super Saiyan for the first time. And right before you think things are going to take that Namekian turn or that planet Namek turn, we see like, like this circle of regular color kind of appear in the air and then explode outward and everything kind of suddenly turns back to its original color and shape. It's a really cool artistic choice and it really sets a, a really great backdrop for this fight that is quite literally deciding the fate of the universe and as we kind of see these pillars of the ground erupt up underneath both Boo and Goku, creating uh, not exactly a parallel to Vegeta versus Goku in the Saiyan arc, but it gives a little bit of a, a similar vibe. Uh, that is where this episode wraps up. Unfortunately, I would love to do the rest of this fight because it's so good. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, this is a great point to end on because now rather than ending last episode where I feel kind of let down and a little disappointed, now I'm hyped. Like, it was hard for me to stop watching because, you know, uh, the next episode's coming on and it's getting good. And man, now, now I got to hold back and I got to wait. And you guys are going to have to wait two weeks before we get into that. I know, I know. We we try to keep these uh, the number of episodes that we cover not only manageable for us, but also manageable for us to talk about because we're already been talking for two hours at this point. <laughs> <laughs> well, all right. So, um, what's your opinion of this chunk of episodes we just went over tonight? 
I have so many strong feelings high and low, which I think is kind of the sentiment that you and I both voiced when we when we started recording. Like I'm I'm so frustrated that we don't get the the follow through of Gohan, Goten and Trunks being the new heroes. Like I think you said it perfectly where Goku being dead and having to go back to other world and Vegeta sacrificing himself, dying against Boo, both of them being out of the picture is the perfect setup to pass the torch to the next generation. And we get to see that kind of play out. We get to see Goten and Trunks fail. We get to see Gohan fail. And then Gohan and Vegeta just come back into the scene. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, it's like, all right, Gohan, get out of here. All right. Go tanks, get out of here. And the thing is, is I don't mind um, necessarily Goku and Vegeta coming back and saving the day for whatever reason. But I need to feel like like there was some sort of, of pot of gold at the end of each of these characters' rainbows, their, their story rainbows. Because right now, I look at Gohan. I have no idea if Gohan learned anything. It really doesn't feel like it. He just kind of got a a power boost from sitting with Akai for a couple days. Um, and then go tanks. The fusion is a neat trick, but I don't like that. That was basically their character arc was learning fusion. Yeah. You, you had one or two good ideas about their, their character arc last time. I, I think I'm a little bit less bothered by that. I actually like the idea that, at the very least, I, I I think there could be more to it, but I like the idea that Goten and Trunks are both very young, were put in this position where they need to be the saviors of the Earth, and they botched it. Like, they're, they're still children, they messed it up, they got cocky, whatever the case is. Totally on board with that. Totally on board with Gohan kind of having to be the one who comes in to correct their their mistake uh that i think that's great writing great storytelling makes sense but then gohan like you said what is his arc like <laughs> uh, there he basically found out like okay i need to fight again but then he gets his shit slapped in and now his dad has to pick his butt out of the fire too like <laughs> yeah silly. and i mean gohan had all that development in the cell arc and all the stuff that we thought we were going to build on and then we regress right backwards through all of that right so now we have an entire series that we just watched that kind of feels like it didn't have any lasting effect like gohan's reverted kind of i don't know back to being kind of nothing and oh one thing i wanted to point out with um goten and trunks is I'm upset that they didn't learn um, to stand in their own two feet without fusion because um, if they if they move away from it and they start refusing to use it, then they're following in the footsteps of their dads. And that feels like a much more complete story arc for them versus we ended with them not being able to do anything unless they're fused. And that feels like a bad end point for me. I don't mind that being a part of their journey. I just would have liked if they would have had um, like a similar journey to their fathers who learned or who refused to do anything but stand in their own two feet. And I wish I would have seen some of that or at least some some of that similarity. That's fair. I I don't think that I necessarily need that one. Like it in some ways. I mean, the fusion is literally a tool to make Goten and Trunks relevant, right? Um, and other ways to, like, power up Goku and Vegeta, whatever. But I think, to your point, we we see the negative ramifications of that in Super, where the only time... I mean, I mean Goten and Trunks are almost completely disregarded in Super, but the only times that they show up as anything significant at all is when they fuse into Gotenks. And it's... Yeah, they they don't even feel like characters of their own at that point. Yeah, and I will say, um, oddly enough, the, 
the, there were a few humorous moments in here that were really on point in this chunk of episodes we watch. I mean, I agree with you. The one where uh, Gohan misses catching the Patara earring feels kind of weird, and I don't know why we're spending time on that. Um, and then also the uh, the Balma picks thing. In a way, there is some humor to it, not because of the nudie pics, but because of the Vegeta being like, hey, hey, like, dude, what the hell are you doing? Like, that's pretty funny. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I like that aspect of it. Um, there there were a number of great gags in here that I enjoyed. I liked the the unceremonious death of the Grand Kai, at least the gag part of it. Uh, I really enjoyed the gag that we we just talked about with um them doing the rock paper scissors to see who gets to fight boo that's super on brand dragon ball humor um i it's such a mixed bag like the vegito fight i'm shocked like i remember the vegito fight from like as a kid the memory that i had created of it was that it was much better animated and much better choreography than it was it has great pieces like I, I will never get tired of the fucking candy whooping Boo's ass, but I was just surprised that they didn't bring their A game animators and choreographers to what should be a really big fight. Yeah, for for some reason the the image in my head or my memory of it 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 was I don't know like it was a top tier fight. It was something that was much better than than what I had watched, which. I mean, it was fine. Like the animation was fine, but it wasn't great. And the choreography, there's really nothing that stands out as far as choreography. Um, everything was pretty boilerplate Dragon Ball moves. Um, the the energy sword or beam or whatever, that's pretty cool. I would have liked to have seen some stuff done with it other than what we did see. I don't know. I just, my memory of Vegito or... Vegito, Vegeta. Vegito was definitely better than um I think what it actually was. And so maybe that made me a little bit more disappointed than what I should have been. Um, but I mean it's fine. It's also a character that I don't, I don't know. Vegeta's a weird character to have exist, so it's not something that really should pop up that often or if ever again. Yeah, I even them bringing him back in super like I was excited, but I will, I will forever hate that Patara earring retcon. I think it is so stupid, but I mean, for these episodes, there's like, it definitely, they definitely elicit strong emotions, but it's, it's a lot of negative. And then there's, there's a, there's a mixture of positive stuff in there. I'm really excited to get into the next set of episodes because, I mean, we just got like the the teaser of the fight between Goku and Boo, and I remember that fight being really good. So my my opinion on this is I'm looking forward to it because I think I'm going to get some some basically fight porn. Um, the one thing that this doesn't have for me though at this point is I'm not emotionally invested in this fight. I don't really feel any build up to this these two characters meeting each other. Like it kind of means nothing to me. It's just I'm going to watch a badass fight. I think I can understand that. I think I have more investment because I know the character development that is coming and it's it's not it's not Goku and Boo. It's Vegeta and Mr. Satan that is important to me. Um so I I can kind of see where you're coming from with that. I know a lot of people a lot of the fan base will describe Majin Buu, especially evil, sorry, Kid Buu, as being more of a force of nature to overcome than like a character himself. And at this point in the story, I think I'm perfectly okay with that being the case. Like they just need to overcome this challenge that is Kid Buu. Uh, he's, no, he's not going to give us any sort of like, interesting character dynamics like Frieza would or even Cell would. But that's that's not what we need from him. Um, and maybe I'm giving some concessions because we've kind of already lost 
track of the story that I really wanted to be told mm. with Gohan, particularly kind of being the the mantle of the main character and the hero being passed on to him. So I'm kind of like, well, this is what we get. Yeah, I, I mean, it's, you know, when when this battle ends, it's what does the hero get by beating the villain? And then what did the villain lose by being defeated? And I don't know, like Goku and Vegeta are going to be fighting him. I don't think they really gain anything from killing Kid Buu other than like they won the day and then like Kid Buu doesn't have any aspirations or anything. So it's not like he's got plans that are now laid the waste. I just I have no investment in the battle other than I know it's going to be badass. And I agree with you um, with the Mr. Satan stuff. That is fantastic. That doesn't really have to do with the power dynamic, though, of these two or of the two main characters that are happening. He just has a cool scene and he plays a, an important role in something that happens. But I don't know. Like, I. There's no bit. I don't know. I don't like it. I just don't like how they built up all these characters and then we just go back to this default. And I. It's not like when Gohan fights Cell and there are moments where I'm like, like, God damn, like I'm tearing up this shit so good. Like, I'm not going to get any of that other than for maybe Mr. Satan coming up. Yeah, I, I I get your point. I think we're mostly on the same page. I think that I'm a little bit more forgiving of it because for me, the, the fact that we have the set piece of Goku and Boo fighting in the background is what facilitates the character development that we get with Vegeta and Mr. Satan. So I'm okay with that, with the fight of Goku and Boo being slightly less important because of what we get out of Vegeta and Mr. Satan. But it is, it is kind of a consolation prize from what I really wanted this story to be. Yeah, yeah, it's... It's fine. We're going to get a good fight that looks great. Um and that's that's all I'm really getting out of it. We'll we'll see if I agree as much with Vegeta's character growth and um Mr. Mr. Satan's been going through character growth. I think he's probably the most developed character involved at this point. Or the most progressed. Yeah, probably. I mean, I I would maybe argue for Vegeta, but I I I would maybe put Mr. Satan above Vegeta in terms of character progression for the Boo arc as a whole, I think. Yeah, it's 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 pretty neat. Um, but yeah, that's that's my opinion on this chunks of, of, of episodes. Yeah, I honestly I think that's mostly all I have to I'm I'm excited to get to the the next chunk, which is actually gonna be us wrapping up Dragon Ball Z Kai. Ooh, that's fucking wild. I didn't think we were going to be saying those words that fast. Yeah, yeah, I know. Uh, but yeah, I think at this point I, I would just be rambling and kind of repeating myself. Uh, do you, did you have anything else you wanted to discuss on this topic, Dayton? Hell no, let's get to the good stuff. All right, that's going to be it for this episode of Instant Transmission, where we discuss everything Dragon Ball. This has been your host, Todd. And Dayton. Don't forget, we're on Patreon and Twitter. If you want to help the podcast Kaioken its way to greater power, you can find us at patreon.com slash ITDB podcast. That stands for Instant Transmission Dragon Ball Podcast. And over on Twitter at x.com slash ITDB podcast. Please like, review, subscribe, whatever that internet stuff is on whatever podcasting platform you're listening to us on. And thank you guys all so much for your support. Be sure to join us next time as we wait in King Yemma's horrendous line in part three <laughs> of the Evil Boo arc. The Earth has been destroyed, and the world of the Kais might not be far behind if Goku and Vegeta can't figure out a way to stop the force of nature that is Kid Boo. Will Super Saiyan 3 be enough to deliver the finishing blow? What does Vegeta have to offer despite being weaker than Goku? Could this be curtains for beloved world champ Mr. Satan? Find out a next time. And to all our fellow Dragon Ball fans, stay safe out there and remember to keep rocking the dragon.
Man, I can't wait to re-listen to that dumpster fire of an intro in four months. <laughs> I loved it. <laughs> <laughs>